I'm a pilot, and this is me doing what I just love. I'm flying aerobatics in the back seat of this beautiful World War II plane. It's a Warhawk P-40 T, one of the few in existence. And it's a beautiful day. We're doing loops and rolls and for a few brief magical moments. I was defying gravity and reaching for the stars. But of course, it takes powerful rockets to escape the pervasive pull of gravity. Unlike all environmental factors which have undergone continuous change, air temperatures, water levels, climates, geography, only gravity has remained constant throughout all of Earth's history and therefore has fundamentally shaped life on this planet like no other factor. But it wasn't until we started sending humans into space that we realized how important gravity was for our health. Back in the 50s, 60s, and the early days of spaceflight, they didn't even know if humans could survive or function in space. If an astronaut swallowed, would the food go down? Or without gravity, would it just come right back up? But surprisingly, those early astronauts did really well, like the Apollo 11 astronauts here on the historic moon landing flight. And it wasn't until later when mission lengths became longer, like weeks on the space shuttle or months on the space station, that we started seeing the detrimental effects of weightlessness. Now, contrary to popular belief, when astronauts are orbiting the Earth, they're still experiencing gravity pretty much like the gravity that we're experiencing here. It's just that the force of gravity is counterbalanced by other forces, so it gives a sensation of weightlessness. And NASA calls this condition microgravity. And microgravity affects essentially all of the systems of the body. There's loss of muscle mass, loss of bone strength, cardiovascular deconditioning, impaired immune function, and so NASA has worked extensively throughout the years to develop successful countermeasures to overcome these problems like daily exercise and nutrition. But more recently, astronauts have begun to experience other problems. They've had problems with their visions. And when they get back, they have increased pressure around their brain. And they have balance problems. The vision problems are such that astronauts are actually given adjustable eyeglasses to take with them into space. They're called space anticipation glasses. I'm a physician, I'm a neuroradiologist. I use brain imaging to make diagnoses. And in my clinic, I've started seeing patients with symptoms similar to what the astronauts are experiencing. And so that led to my ongoing studies with NASA and I'm gonna tell you about them today. But guess what? The brain, just like the rest of the body, needs gravity to stay healthy. Now this is a human brain. All our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, memories, right here. It's within the skull, it's completely surrounded by a fluid, it's called cerebral spinal fluid. And there's also cerebral spinal fluid in the center of the brain in a place called the ventricles. The brain literally floats within this fluid. And the astronauts after space flight, the brain actually has shifted upwards within the skull. As the brain moves upwards, there's less fluid around the top of the brain. It's a part of the brain that's critical for movement of the body. And instead, there's increased fluid within the center of the brain in the ventricles. Now, we don't know if this is a positive adaptation to space flight or if in the long run, it will turn out to be harmful for future space travelers. But we do know that by seeing which parts of the brain are affected in astronauts after space flight, it gives us more information to understand our patients 
who are experiencing similar symptoms here on Earth, such as patients with vision problems and balance problems. Another issue that the astronauts have to face is because they're in the enclosed environment of the space station, carbon dioxide levels tend to be slightly higher than they are here on Earth. We wondered if the combination of the higher carbon dioxide levels along with microgravity could lead to changes in the brain. And so we did a study with NASA and the German Aerospace Center last December. Because it's expensive to send humans into space, NASA studies what happens to the body by putting people to bed for long periods of time. Now, why, you might ask? That's because when we're standing here, gravity pulls fluids to the lower part of our body, but in microgravity, those fluids just move upwards towards the head, and astronauts actually experience swollen faces. And NASA being a very technical scientific agency, they've termed this condition puffy face syndrome. <laughs> to mimic puffy face syndrome here on Earth, we put people to bed for long periods of time. And that, along with having our volunteers breathe in slightly higher carbon dioxide levels, is what we asked them to do for four straight weeks in a row. We were interested in how this would affect their brain. And so we measured blood flow to their head. And here's what we saw. The bright red and yellow colors indicates increased flow to the brain, whereas the blue colors indicate decreased blood flow to the brain. Before we started the study, we thought, well, there's higher carbon dioxide levels, and the brain would go, I need some more oxygen up here, send me some more blood. But instead, we found just the opposite. We were wrong. These results actually might help explain why some astronauts experience headaches when they're in space. Have you heard of an astronaut, Scott Kelly? He spent a year in space and wrote a book about it when he got back. And, he, and in that book, he described his experience with the higher carbon dioxide levels. These results are also important for patients here on Earth, such as patients who have trouble breathing and retain carbon dioxide and are, are bed bound, or patients with a condition known as sleep apnea. So by studying what happens to the human brain in space, we're testing the very limits of how the brain works, and we're learning information, such as how important gravity is for maintaining our brain health. And in retrospect, we really shouldn't have been surprised because we were made for this unique one-gravity environment here on Earth. If we send humans back to the moon, where the moon is one-sixth gravity, and Mars, where it's one-third gravity, unlike in the movies, we're going to have to find ways to keep them healthy, such as by providing artificial gravity or maybe simulated gravity in specially designed spacesuits. While we're busy working on the really complicated part of any space flight, that is the human body, well, the easy part, rocket science, has almost been solved. I mean, we're ready to send humans back to the moon soon, and also announced in five years, we'll have humans back on the moon and on to Mars. And this year, in the next few months, for the first time ever, Americans will be going to space from American soil, not on government-built rockets, but for the first time ever on rockets built by private companies. With the commercialization of spaceflight, just like in the airline industry, companies will be selling you and me tickets to go into space. So where will all of us new space tourists go? It's not science fiction. It's science facts. This is your hotel room. It's already on the space station. It's been there for two years. When you call to make that reservation, Remember we talked about how important gravity is for your brain health. Please do not forget to pack your gravity pants. <laughs> Thank you.